Recently, I've been to Brazil on holidays, and on the very long way back to Australia, I binge watched HBO's awarded series Chernobyl. And the show is phenomenal. Acting, cinematography, sound, soundtrack, everything is top notch. But in my opinion, what really makes this show special is the storytelling. Now, this video is not an analysis of the show, it's in fact a reflection about what we can learn from the show Chernobyl and from the accident itself. The show is actually not about an explosion in a nuclear power plant. The show is in fact about the people, the people that were involved in that situation that had to deal with that extremely difficult problem that was unimaginable to them. Now please tell me how an RBMK reactor core explodes. I don't see how it could explode. But it did. And as I was watching that story developed and how the inept and arrogant Soviet bureaucrats dealt with that situation, I could not stop thinking about what we can learn from that terrible tragedy that cost the lives and the homes of so many people. Now, I never went to nuke school, so I really don't know anything of the technical stuff. The show has an explanation, but still is a really dumbed down explanation of what actually happened. Scott Manley has a great video explaining everything in detail that even a lay person can understand what actually happened in the reactor in Chernobyl that led to its explosion. Now the short version is, a nuclear reactor is about balance. You have uranium and you have these other elements that are inserted in the reactor in order to control the rate of fission. The more fission you have, the more power it generates, the less fission, the less, less power it generates. So the, the reactor had this number of control rods, half of them made of graphite, half of them made of boron. Now the graphite in them would cause the reactions to the rate of fission to, to increase and it will produce more energy while the boron would cause the rate of fission to decrease and produce less energy. Due to a number of factors on that day, most of the control rods had been removed from the reactor. And on that day they were running a test and the test didn't go well. And in order to stop everything, the guy in control, the guy in the control room pressed the shutdown button. The button that's supposed to shut down the reactor and stop everything. But the problem is what that button does is to increase all the control rods. And since then, most of them had been removed, inserted a lot of graphite in the reactor, which accelerated, increased the rate of fission, made the reactor produce more energy, and for some reason that caused all those rods to jam. And when they jam, all that graphite was in there, stuck in that position, making the reactor into pretty much, I believe, a bomb. And that's why it exploded and spread all that uh, radioactive material in the area. Now, of course, much of what is shown in the HBO series is dramatized, exaggerated. Uh, the author, the writer, the director took some artistic liberties in what they did. Of course, you can expect all of that in a TV show. But one important thing in a show, and that is historically accurate, is that the officials in the Soviet government knew about the flaws of the reactor. Re uh, scientists had warned them about it, and they decided to not do anything about that. Now, of course, after Chernobyl, there was no longer way to deny that the RBMK reactors had some flaws, and some changes were made in order to make them safer. And this negligence of uh, the officials in the Soviet Union is where I think we can draw some very good parallels with what is happening in the world today. Everything that I am about to show you now are facts. 19 of the 20th warmest years on record happened since 2001 and 2019 has been the second warmest year on record. The data collected by NASA and other agencies and scientists around the world is unequivocal. Here in Australia, for example, we had the worst bushfire season in 2009 that killed 180 people in Victoria. The current fire season that is happening this summer is one of the worst on record as well. Also, in the last 20 years, Australia had some of its worst droughts 
ever, with the current drought being the worst in its history. In America, the 2018 wildfire season in California was the worst ever, and heavy precipitation has increased a lot in America and globally as it has been predicted by climate models. Now some of you might brush it off and say that uh, droughts, wildfire, all of that stuff always happen in California, always happen in Australia. It's not something new. And more heavy rain means that the world is getting wetter and not hotter. You might also say that any rise in temperature can explain by a number of other factors, not anthropogenic CO2 as the uh, scientists claim it is. Another thing you could do is say that there is no scientific consensus and you would point out to physicists and Nobel Prize winner Dr. Eva Giva. Dr. Giva is a scientist, he is a Nobel Prize winner, and he does say that climate change is all bogus. One thing that we can't deny though is that Eva Giva is deep in the pockets of the Koch brothers. Now, the Koch brothers are among the richest and most influential activists and lobbyists in maintaining the fossil fuel industry unregulated in America. Also, installing development of renewable and alternative energy sources with tax cuts, benefits, etc. So here you are presented with a choice. You can choose to trust these hack scientists, hack commentators on the internet, or you can choose to trust the scientists. The scientists who put their work under scrutiny of peer-reviewed in top scientific journals who do their work according to the scientific method, who work for organizations such as NASA and the Climate Council in Australia that do actual research, field research about climate change. So you choose whether you want to believe the scientific facts or you don't. I've given you everything I know. They'll deny it, of course. They always do. There is one particular detail about Chernobyl that is really ironic to the point of comedy. Now, the main reasons why uh, Soviet officials decided to not change RBMK reactors was because of the cost, because RBM RBMK reactors were very cheap. They thought it was not worth it to raise the price in rubles to make all those changes in the odd chance that a reactor could malfunction or some incident could happen. Now, as we know, an RBMK reactor did malfunction and actually the cost was very, very high, not only in rubles, but also in, in life, both human and animal. And the amount of resources necessary to clean up after Chernobyl was gargantuan, was, was definitely way more than it would have costed to just change the technology and solve those problems and the reactors in the first place. The comedy in all of this is that the climate skeptics have pretty much the same arguments and the same mentality that those uh, officials from the Soviet Union, is that, oh, you know, to change uh, our energy sources are going to be too, co too costly, it's going to slow down our economy. When they are being subsidized through um, grant programs or through targeted tax credits, takes resources away from other sectors, potentially more productive sectors of the economy. In fact, in the last election here in Australia, one of the key points that made the conservative coalition to win the election was that the, the plan to cut carbon emissions from labor was too expensive, was going to cost too much to the country. So what is funny and ironic about all of this, of course, is that the conservatives, climate skeptics these days have pretty much the same arguments and the same mindset as those cheapskates in the Soviet Union in the late 80s. Now, of course, that despite some similarities, there are also a number of differences between the tragedy in Chernobyl and uh, climate change. There are a lot, a lot of things that are very dissimilar. For example, the effects of an explosion of a nuclear reactor are instantaneous, and the effects of radiation can be noticed um, after a couple of weeks. Also, an explosion is a localized event, so you can easily make a connection between cause and effect between the explosion and the effects of radiation. But the effects of climate change are different. They are not localized, they are global, and it takes longer for them to manifest. So to establish a causal link between climatic events and climate change is a lot more difficult. Also, when you look at what the science actually 
success, it is not the number of climatic events, it's not that more climatic events are happening, but it is in fact the intensity of them that is changing because of climate change, because of global warming. So it is not that we're having more or less droughts or that we're having more or less fires, but they are becoming more intense. So of course people can say, oh, all of these things hadn't used to happen before hurricanes, droughts, fires, sure they did, but not like this. They are becoming more and more intense, more and more difficult, more and more costly to us. Also, this correlation between the intensity of climatic events, the rise in CO2, the rise in temperature, the number of CO2 emissions by humans, this correlation is very powerful and you can't deny that it happens, it is a fact. And that is why it's becoming increasingly difficult to deny that climate change and global, global warming are happening and that we are causing it. Many of its effects are already irreversible and we, our generation and the generations next to us are going to experience some of them and there is nothing we can do about it. And the longer we take to do something about it and cut down CO2 emissions, more generations after us will have to pay the price. And the price will be, of course, more intense climatic events, more severe droughts, hurricanes, floods, sea level rise, disruption of entire ecosystems that are going to be damaged or some of them might even be lost because of climate change. And all of it could have an effect, for example, on food supply chains. Starvation could become an increasingly worse problem. Another effect, of course, would be more people to die from these climate events because they're going to become increasingly more dangerous and of course more people be displaced, more people lose their homes and they're gonna have to find somewhere else to live so we're probably gonna have more refugees, climate refugees, they're going to come to developed countries to start a new life so this problem that we have with immigration could also become increasingly worse. Now I personally believe that climate change will be the driving force of geopolitics in the second half of our century and probably of the 22nd century. And I am quite pessimist about it. I think our leaders are going to be like the Soviet leaders in the 80s. They're gonna pretend that everything is fine or, or, or they might acknowledge that there are some problems but they're not gonna do much about it. And they're only gonna start moving their asses when it becomes not only impossible to deny the problem, but when the effects of the problem become so great that it's only going to be a damage control at that point. Because I think we as a species have an incredible capacity to not learn from our past mistakes. And Chernobyl provide us with a great opportunity to look at something that our inaction, what our inaction can cause. And we could learn from that, but I don't think we will. Because no matter how many times facts like I've shown in this video are shown to some people, they still refuse to learn it. They are still in denial and they don't seem to want to get out of it. Every lie we tell incurs a debt to the truth. Sooner or later that debt is paid. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave it a like, leave it a comment, share it, subscribe to my channel. As always, a big thank you to my subscribers and a massive ultra thank you to my patrons. Your support means a lot to me. I've been Sarah Michelle and I will see you next time. Cheers.